you're on. Well, to start tonight's lesson, is it human nature not to show appreciation for what somebody else freely does for your help, to help you or for your benefit? You know, how many people on earth really don't appreciate the perfect planet that we live on? All the things that God provides. We're going to look into Paul continuing with his response to the Corinthians and questions which they raised. But also in tonight's lesson, we're going to start to get into what Paul had in mind and how to deal with the Corinthians, the bigger picture. Uh, I There was a study that was done where they had a number, a group of preteen boys they let them live in a house. They provided food, everything that they needed, but they left them unsupervised for 10 days. Oh, geez. And yeah, you can <laughs> imagine what happened. Um, the play, it, it turned into total chaos. The house was trashed. The kids were not taking care of them or feeding themselves. They, they had to stop the 10 day period within seven days just to rescue the boys. They did the same type of study with girls. They fared a little bit better. They did break down and organize, and they were able to do basic things of cooking and cleaning. They didn't trash the house quite as much as the boys, but it goes to show what unsupervision, lack of supervision results in human behavior. When I looked at chapter 10 of the first epistle that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, it has a little bit of a summary of things that we've already covered before, yet it prepares the way for the message that Paul will give later about love and how love really should be the driving force in human nature. But eh, there's so much in chapter 10 that I had to break it down. I titled this tonight's lesson, Was Paul a Once Saved, Always Saved Calvinist? Part one. When I asked that question, Calvin basically said that you have God chooses who he's going to save, irresistible grace, that he's not going to have you elected to salvation and then have you lose your salvation. As we go through what Paul is saying in chapter 10, is Paul saying that the Corinthians could lose their salvation? Or is God going to deal with them in a different way? And so we're going to get into the first 13 verses of chapter 10 and look at what Paul's initial response, uh, that's sort of a summary and a response to the Corinthians generally. Now, over the past few weeks, we've studied Paul's responses to questions presented to him by members of the church in Corinth, which Paul established during his second missionary journey. Tonight's lesson doesn't deal or doesn't indicate that it deals with a specific question. It's sort of a summary. Not only did Paul share the gospel of salvation to the Corinthians, he also introduced them to their how their salvation was based upon grace and not on strict adherence to the law. That believers were liberated by the gospel. Now, we don't know exactly what Paul said in teaching the gospel to the Corinthians, but we know from the problems that he's addressing that the Corinthians felt that they had knowledge that the gospel came from God, that there is one true God, and that they were no longer under the Old Testament law so that they could take eat food that was sacrificed to idols because they knew that the food wasn't uh, representing any deity or any had any magic attached to it. Paul Taking liberty with Paul, what Paul had taught them, many members of the Corinthian church continued to participate in the pagan activities which took place in Corinth, believing that their knowledge about the gospel allowed them to exercise their liberties without consequence. In the earlier chapters of his first epistle to the Corinthians, Paul explained that those in the church who possessed knowledge about God's plan of salvation, but who continued to exercise their liberties with those in the pagan culture, 
were causing other weaker members of the Corinthian church to stumble. Urging members of the Corinthian church to act out of love by taking into consideration the example that they were presenting to weaker members of their church, Paul reminded the Corinthians that although he was an apostle, possessed, uh, and, and as an apostle he possessed and could otherwise claim all the rights and privileges that many of the other apostles were receiving and held, he decided to forfeit those rights for the sake of presenting the gospel without charge. Paul was trying to send an example of saying, listen, the gospel is so important and people need to understand and receive the gospel in order to be saved that I'm not going to confuse the issue by charging like the other sophists in Corinth did. In chapter 10 of his first epistle to the Corinthians, Paul warned the Corinthians that their continued exercise of their liberties in Christ was displeasing to God and could lead to God's discipline and to God withholding the blessings which the Corinthians had received. To teach the Corinthians about how God viewed their behavior, Paul used the experience of the nation of Israel in the, as an illustration or example. In verses 6 of chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote, Now these things, talking about the nation of Israel in the wilderness, occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did, the Israelites, when they were in the, uh, the desert going to the promised land. In verse 11, Paul writes, These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the fulfillment of the ages have come. Paul viewed the death of Jesus on the Christ, his resurrection, the Holy Spirit being sent, and the spreading of the gospel is the fulfillment of what was promised in the Old Testament. And he felt that the Corinthians were recipients of the fulfillment of the promises of the Old Testament. But he wrote, what happened to the Israelites when they were in the desert is illustrative of what you should be warned about in exercising your liberties of what was foretold in the Old Testament. As I mentioned before, chapter 10 is a pivotal chapter in Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians. In order to understand Paul's teachings in chapter 10, it's necessary to understand Paul's use of the wilderness experience of the nation of Israel as an example or illustration. Why did Paul refer to this specific part of the Old Testament? The main message that I want you to get from tonight's lesson is that using the wilderness experience of the nation of Israel as an example, Paul warned the Corinthians that the unrestrained and sinful exercise of their liberty from the law was displeasing to God and would result in God disciplining those engaged in such displeasing activities and in the Corinthian church and its members losing the blessings which God had given them in the same manner as the Israelites in the wilderness lost their blessings from God. By way of outline, we're going to talk about Paul's use of the wilderness experience of the nation of Israel as an example to the Corinthians. What were Paul's concerns about the behavior of members of the Corinthian church which were displeasing to God? What happened with the nation of Israel during their experience in the wilderness? What teachings to the Corinthians did Paul draw from what happened to the Israelites in the wilderness? Then we have some great discussion questions which will elaborate our, our lesson. So let's go to the first part of what our discussion tonight is, and that is, what were Paul's concerns about the behavior of the members of the Corinthian church, which was displeasing to God? Making reference to the wilderness experience of the nation of Israel, Paul identified four areas of concern, which he believed were relevant to what the Corinthians were doing. Idolatry, sexual immorality, testing the Lord, and complaining. I'm going to go through the portions of chapter 10, the first part of chapter 10, where Paul refers to these four activities that the Corinthians were engaged in that were displeasing to the Lord. Paul writes, do not be idolaters, as some of them were, the people that were in the wilderness in Israel. As it is written, and he's talking about the people in the wilderness, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. That's verse 7. Sexual immorality is the second thing that Paul identified as uh, experienced by the nation of Israel in the wilderness. 
that he's condemning the Corinthian church for doing. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. That's verse 8 of chapter 10. The next thing he identified is testing or trying the patience of the Lord. Paul writes in verse 9, we should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. The last thing that Paul identified was complaining about what Moses and God had done for them. He writes in verse 10, and do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. So Paul is looking at these four areas that really talking to the Corinthian church, it gives us an idea of what Paul's observation of the Corinthian church in, its, in the big picture was going on. When we look at and we study this example that Paul is using with the what happened with the Israelites in the wilderness, we look at a chain of events. And I can remember when we studied in the book of Exodus, what God had done for the Israelites and then what they did is it started out with lack of self-control. It led to their disobedience. It led to their death. And so this is the pattern that we're going to see that Paul talks about. Now, when we Paul was equating the salvation that he was experienced by the Israelites when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt into the wilderness toward the promised land, that was considered a deliverance or a salvation. And Paul equated the salvation that God gave to the Israelites to the salvation experienced by the Corinthians. And he was comparing Israel's response, which was displeasing to God, to the response of the Corinthians, which was likewise displeasing to God. So let's go into an overview, not in going into the specific parts of Exodus and Numbers, but what happened with the nation of Israel during their experience in the wilderness. In using the wilderness experience of the nation of Israel as an example for the Corinthians, Paul began by telling the Corinthians that everything that God had done for the Israelites. So in verses 1 through 3, Paul writes, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. So he's talking about the Israelites, that there's a number of things that God did for them that I think we can equate to the salvation experience of what God did to the Corinthians. First, God called Moses as his servant to lead Israel to the land, the destination which God had promised to Abraham. In verse 2, Paul wrote, they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Here, baptism isn't a matter of sanctification, although Moses gave them the law that was to deal with their righteous behavior. Really, we're talking about is that God chose Moses, and through Moses, God led the nation of Israel, unified the nation of Israel, uh, of Israel and had a relationship uh, where God was present with the nation of Israel. And so Paul is emphasizing baptized is transformed so that there are people of God. And Moses is their leader receiving his instructions and authority from God. So the, the emphasis here that Paul is making is that the entire nation was baptized or united through God, through what God did through Moses. Like the Corinthians, the Israelites were called out by God for salvation. God specifically called Paul to go to Corinth because he had people in Corinth that he wanted to save. And so just like God sent Moses, there's an inference that Paul was sent the same way to Corinth. Now, through Moses, God delivered the nation of Israel from Egypt. Paul writes, our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. The cloud, the pillar of cloud during the day and the pillar of fire at night, 
was used by God to lead the people to show them the direction that they should go. It took them to the Red Sea. The Egyptian army followed. And God, through Moses, opened up the sea. The Israelites went through the sea, passed through the sea. When the Egyptians went into the sea, the waters closed upon them and, and destroyed the army. That was the point of salvation. From that point on, Israel was no longer threatened by Egypt because Egypt lost its army. And so it, that's the deliverance. That was the completion of the deliverance of the nation of Israel out of Egypt. And so Paul is referring that God brought salvation or deliverance to the nation of Israel. So what was happening in Israel? They were slaves. They were bonded to a, a very secular pagan worship culture. And they were called out of that culture. And just saying that, you almost think of the same thing happening with the Corinthians. They lived in a pagan culture. They lived in a, a, a culture where idol worship was a very common practice. Paul was sent to Corinth, and the people that were in the church were called out of that culture. Then we talk about the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire at night, which God sent to the Israelites. It protected, sheltered, and guided Israel as they went toward the promised land. God used the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire to guide the nation of Israel through the wilderness. The pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire sheltered and protected the nation of Israel. If you ever were uh, served in Iraq or in the deserts of Saudi Arabia or the peninsula, temperatures during the day could be well over 100 degrees. Yet God covered and sheltered Israel from the heat. Uh, other scriptures say that while the people of Israel were in the wilderness, their clothes did not disintegrate. Their shoes and sandals did not wear out. This, the cloud and the fire, not only was a guidance or God leading, it's also something that sheltered, protected, and uh, kept them uh, thriving while they're in the desert. Through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, Guide the God guided and protected the Corinthians. Then the, Paul also emphasized the provision of food in the wilderness. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, and they drank, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. We know that God provided manna from heaven. We know that from scriptures that this manna was sufficient to sustain the Israelites. They gathered it each day, except on the sixth day, they gathered, uh, gathered a double portion. And it tasted sweet like honey, and it was full of nutrients. They could use it in a number of different ways. Um, I understand there was a cookbook from, from Moses about 101 ways of making manna in the, in the wilderness. The point is, is that God provided a perfect way of nourishing his people and having it freshly provided on a daily basis. As to the water, well, we know, remember that on two occasions, Moses struck the rock, and the rock, out of the rock came abundant water, enough for not only the cattle and the sheep that belonged to the Israelites, but up to a million to two million people that were in the desert and wilderness, and there's enough water that was provided to them. But Moses does, or I mean, no, uh, Paul does something interesting in this, where he refers to who was the rock, who accompanied them, who led them, who provided the banna. He puts it right on the Jesus Christ. And we know that in the wilderness, the angel of the Lord, a reference to the pre incarnate Christ, was with the people of Israel and, and leading them through the wilderness. So what Paul did is he described all these blessings which God had delivered to the nation of Israel as coming from Christ or the rock who accompanied them as they passed through the sea, who guided and sheltered them by the pillar of cloud and by the pillar of fire, and who fed and sustained them by sending the manna and by sending the springing water which poured out from the rock. So Paul starts with the wilderness experience of the nation of Israel by describing all the blessings, all the goodness of God, 
all the salvation that comes from God. So in chapter 10, then Paul, after describing the goodness of God, then he talks about the response that the nation of Israel had to what God had done for them. So after describing everything that God had done for the nation of Israel, Paul then described how the people responded by turning away from God, practicing idolatry, engaging in sexual immorality, by testing the Lord, and by complaining about the Lord himself and through Moses what the Lord had done for them. That's a real show of appreciation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, he says, Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. It's kind of interesting. I When he, I read this, I said, this is an understatement. <laughs> there, God was displeased with most of them. There's only two that uh, people that came out of Egypt that were allowed to go in the promised land. Joshua and Caleb. And they were the two spies that recommended that the Israelites just go into the and conquer the the promised land. All the others were afraid of the giants that were there and did not trust the Lord. But the disobedience of the nation of Israel in the desert resulted in their bodies being scattered throughout the Sinai Peninsula. They all died before they ever got to the promised land. Mm. Now, while God had called all the Israelites, uh, the word all is the operative here, but because they rejected what God had done for them, God caused all the Israelites, except Joshua and Caleb, to die in the wilderness. Some of the people in Israel perished immediately after practicing idolatry by worshiping the golden calf or after engaging in sexual immorality when God took 23,000 lives or after testing the Lord by desiring to return to Egypt or when they complained about Moses' leadership when God sent the snakes. If you recall the book of Exodus and the experience of Moses trying to lead these stiff-necked people to the promised land, you, you, you almost get to the point of saying, as God did, I'm going to destroy them all. But for Moses' intercession for the people, God wanted to have Moses start over with Moses and the generation from Moses. But Moses says to God, he reasoned with God, and he said, well, what would that make you with respect to your reputation? The whole world knows that you brought them and delivered them out of Egypt. And then if you were just to destroy them in the desert, how would that look to your reputation? And God did not choose to destroy the nation of Israel in that manner all at once, like the flood, but he did pronounce judgment against them. And because he pronounced judgment against them and discipline, only two, not even Moses, was allowed to go in the promised land. So basically the big picture of what Paul is drawing from the experience that the Israelites had in the wilderness is that look at all the things that God had done for the Israelites. He freed them from being slaves. He fed them. He guided them. He dwelt with them. And what was their response? They rejected pretty much every goodness of God. Now Paul wants to address the Corinthian church. What teachings to the Corinthians to the Corinthians did Paul draw from what happened to the Israelites in the wilderness? Paul used the example of what happened to the Israelites in the wilderness who displeased God to warn the Corinthians about turning away from God by their practicing idolatry, sexual immorality, testing God's patience, God's testing God's long suffering, and complaining about Paul. Isn't that what we've been studying for the last few weeks? You know, it's as Yogi Bear said, it's deja vu all over again. Hmm. Paul told the Corinthians that after their association with idol and pagan worship, they're engaging in sexual immorality and their undue criticism, there's going to be consequences. He's he's teaching them that, you know, God is not, not just grace, mercy, forgiveness, that God is God, and he expects his people that are called into salvation to be holy. 
the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. Just because the Corinthians had fulfilled the promises of the Old Testament, which God made to Abraham and to the Israelites, did not exempt the Corinthians from losing their blessings for falling away and displeasing God. I think that's a message that speaks to the church today. We think that the that we can take advantage or take for granted God's mercy, God's forgiveness, the burden and the sin that Jesus bear, bore on the cross and substitution for ours. But we we are just as capable as the people of Israel for finding ways to displease God. So I'm repeating what we read before. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages have come. Like the Israelites, the Corinthians were acting as if God would never withdraw from them his grace of salvation, which they received. So Paul goes on to write, verse 12, So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. And when Paul is talking about standing firm, he's talking about don't be overconfident. Don't think that you're immune from falling away from God's pleasure or grace. Don't believe that you're self-righteous because you've been justified by the death of Christ on the cross. There, don't think that you're being independent of being accountable to God for your behavior. So Paul is saying, basically, if this happened to the people that God chose and led out of Egypt, and provided for in the wilderness for 40 years and who lived in their presence, don't think that just because we're in the New Testament that God has changed in any way in terms of what he expects from those that he calls unto salvation. So Paul then goes on and writes, let's get to the right page here. Just a second here. Like the Israelites, the Corinthians were acting as if God would never withdraw from him the grace of salvation which they received. When Moses went up to the mountain to speak with God, many of the Israelites were tempted to return to the pagan rites and rituals which were part of the Egyptian culture they just left. After Paul left Corinth, many of the Corinthians were tempted to return to and participate in the pagan rites and rituals which were part of the Corinthian culture which they knew before receiving the gospel. After warning the Corinthians of the peril of displeasing God and being disciplined by God for falling away, Paul reminded them that the temptations to fall away and to engage in worldly activities are temptations experienced by all believers. But God in his faithfulness will not allow them to be tempted beyond their power to resist. You know, Paul wrote in verse 13, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. In Paul's theology, there's no such thing as the devil made me do it. <laughs> Each believer is responsible for how he responds to his desires to seek worldly pleasures. Just because we receive the gospel of salvation doesn't mean, like Paul wrote in the book of Romans, that we aren't in the flesh tempted to go back to the fleshly desires that we had before salvation. Um, these, these things are hard to get rid of, but it's common to all believers. If you are truly saved, you're going to struggle with the temptations of the flesh versus the obedience to please God. These worldly desires are common to all men, common to all believers. But Paul, ended this portion of chapter 10 with a message of encouragement to the Corinthians. He assured the Corinthians that if they turned to God, instead of returning to their pagan practices, God would demonstrate his faithfulness by revealing a way for them to resist. He writes, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. This is a theme that Paul is going to develop more in the later part of chapter 10, but it's an important thing to end tonight's lesson with is, is that 
instead of thinking it's hopeless to resist the temptation to go back to the way you were, to do the things that you know are wrong, turn to God. Paul is saying, God is faithful. And I can tell you, in Bible study fellowship, listening to the testimonies of many men who had all sorts of lives that um, were not pleasing to God before they shared the gospel and became saved, how they have relied on this scripture to pray to God, to ask God to remove the temptation, to ask God to replace the temptation, and for them to not be a prisoner to the flesh. And God is faithful. Turn to God and he will reveal to each individual a way of not falling subject to the temptation of the flesh. So the last comment in the, in the study portion of tonight's lesson is that God does not send or create temptation, but God is able to help the believer from yielding to temptation. So with that, we're going to go into a discussion that's going to expand what we learned in these first 13 verses of chapter 10. So we're going to the discussion question starting on page 10. By way of implications or conclusions or applications, these are preliminary because we're not done with chapter 10, but the Corinthians were blessed by God who sent Paul to give them the gospel message and blessed the church by teaching the teach, sending the teachings of all the other preachers who were sent to Corinth to help the church grow and mature. Paul wasn't the only preacher in Corinth. Despite the blessings which the Corinthians received, many in the church continued to engage in practices and activities which were displeasing to God. Drawing from the experience which the Israelites had in the wilderness after receiving salvation from God, Paul warned the Corinthians that God would not ignore what they were doing. The liberty which the Corinthians had received by accepting the gospel of God's grace did not give the Corinthians the liberty to continue doing what displeased God. The God who cut off his blessings to the Israelites who engaged in the idol and pagan worship, the sexual immorality, the testing of God's loving kindness, and who complained about what Moses and God had done for them, is the same God who had cut off his blessings to the Corinthians for doing the same things. By revealing how God handled those who had chosen for salvation in the past, Paul taught the Corinthians that they were standing on a dangerous precipice and that they were about to fall if they continued to do what is displeasing to God. As St. Augustine wrote, what is hidden or concealed in the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. What Paul writes, these things happened to them, the Israelites, as examples and are written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come, the Corinthians. And that's all she wrote. <laughs> Amen. Very good. All right. Let's view. We've got everybody on there. And 